you're alone and life is making you lonely, you can always go downtown. When you've got worries, all the noise and the hurry seems to help, I know. Downtown, just listen to the music of the traffic in the city. Linger on the sidewalk where the neon signs are pretty. How can you lose? The lights are much brighter than you can forget all your troubles, forget all your cares and go downtown. Things will be great when you're downtown. No finer place for sure downtown. Everything's waiting for you. Downtown. I realized that uh, I hadn't celebrated Christmas for a decade, I think. And um, <clears throat> that uh, such is life down in those urine and uh, <clears throat> vomit smelling alleys. One day can just hazily drift into the other until suddenly two or three years have gone by. There are at least three or four years that I can't count for. And one day after another, the same. It was uh, Christmas Day, 2010, I mean. And <clears throat> I wearily dragged myself down to the kitchen where the <coughs> girls were putting the last minute decorations on the tree. I faintly thought I heard some uh, angels singing. And as I, in the kitchen, I could hear the sound getting <coughs> louder and louder. And what do you know, the reindeer has carolers. <coughs> that is wonderful. Well, I uh, boldly suggested that I could accompany them on the piano down in another room. And um, they cheerily agreed, and we all went down and um, I played the piano and they sang Christmas carols. And everyone is gathered around the piano. And I don't know, I had never done that before. And the, just the love and acceptance took all my fears away. Uh, my mom had just moved me and my brothers to the small town in Newbic, Northwest Territories. And uh, it's a really small town and I have a lot of family there and whatever, but uh, it was the summer and uh, I started smoking when I was quite young. I was 14 at this time. And, uh, my mom switched her brand of cigarettes to Craven Menthol just because she didn't want me stealing her smokes. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but um, I remember I decided that I didn't like this town and I wanted to go back to Yellowknife. And, so I decided I was going to try hitchhiking for the first time and I packed like a small uh, like my sleeping bag and some clothes and uh, I stole my mom's pack of cigarettes, her Craven menthols, for the trip and I, I remember walking along the Dempster Highway and there was hardly any traffic, it was late at night, it was maybe like 2 or 3 in the morning and it was like dark and quiet and I was by myself and it was the first time that I was like completely alone and felt like, you know, I had to, you know, fend for myself and that this was it, you know, I'm by myself, it, on my own kind of feeling. And, like, I just remember, like, the scenery, like, being in the, like, wild and there's, you know, all the trees and bushes and, like, uh, little animals and birds and craving menthol cigarettes. Yeah. I didn't make it very far. I ended up uh, getting picked up by the police my mom had called. A long time, and they took me back to town. But yeah, that was uh, my first attempt at hitchhiking anywhere. So that day when I left, we prayed and then we cried together. We prayed our creator and I say, God, please. 
forgive me everything I did wrong, you know, because we are not are perfect, huh? we have mistakes, we are human beings. Everybody has, you know, from one way or the other, they have mistakes. So my, my grandmother and me praying about forgiving my mistake, protecting forever I going. And I left, reached Vancouver, because this is my goal. 1968, when I was working at Tuna Fish Boat, I met Vancouver, and I love. I went to the Stanley Park, see people playing drums, dancing, playing guitar. I said, oh, this is the place I want to be. So thinking in the future, I say, someday I left my country for any reason. This is the place I want to be, Vancouver, BC. It cost me a lot of years, you know. I left my country in 1978, and I reached Vancouver in 1990. But I am I here. That's why I say I, I believe in miracles. When I jump in the river, illegal, you know, naked, like a regular, chum, <laughs> without no, <laughs> no clothes on them. And I reach the other side, you know, wet, so I just, no, no power, just, just, you know, dry myself like that, I put my clothes on there, my underwear, my socks and everything. So immigration is right there, you know, American border. So I go jogging, you know, like I do every side, and I say, good morning, sir. Oh, good morning. You don't want to Yes, sir, I'm jogging. So I sweat because, you know, they thinking I'm sweating. Because I do some edges, I, but I sweat because the river, I swim. In. So I pass and thank to God, not no cut me. So I, till now, and so many people come with money, traveling and playing and first class and bossing and they never made it. And now I know, hey, I left my country with 25 cents in my pocket. And you see what I am? That's why I believe in miracles. <laughs> It's a strange thing going up at 31, but um, yeah, so yeah, uh, the thing was that uh, growing up can also be quite intimidating. I was born and raised just outside a little town called Fernie, in it's very far away from here, and I. I I was raised in what I call a quilted vacuum flask, which means that I was very safe, very secure, but there, there was really no need to grow up in any particular way. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that uh, Jimi Hendrix's song on the Watchtower was, play, was playing in my head. And then, and the, and so, and then finally, I uh, I got out and I and I moved here and um, you know it, it it turns out that I really liked the quilted vacuum class. I, I that I that that it's that it's a bit that it's a, that it's a bit difficult uh, li living without it, but I think I'm doing okay. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it's confusing, but I'm sure things will get better. When we were on our way to Canada, uh, we were on the uh, Air Canada plane, now it's now called Canada 2000. Uh, I, it was uh, uh, turbulence in the air, so I was wearing white uh, nice white pants from from guy from which I which which was bought in Guyana in Georgetown, and I accidentally spilled Pepsi on my pants, so so I couldn't drink Pepsi for one month, <laughs> and um, so 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 my parents said to drink Sprite and Seven Up, so now I drink so now I drink beer now when I came to Vancouver. <laughs> Denise, ah, never ever fall in love with Canadian. No, 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 no school so lazy. But things don't happen the way you want them to, Mom. And um, I met a guy um, who was smart and honest and treated me well. And I had to hide all of those things from my mother who only saw 
you couldn't see the forest beyond the trees. Ah, yeah. Okay. So, um, so, so it was like I had friends that would lie for me. I would lie to my mother about who I was hanging out with. I keep in mind I was a kid that, you know, all I had to do was study and not play outside with the neighbors. Well, only on like certain days, and I couldn't go to sleepovers with my really good friends, and. It was just like this whole world had been open to me because of this person, and I felt like I needed to experience that finally after all this time being good. In my heart, I felt it was worth it. I tried to bring the two parties together, my parents and my boyfriend. I wrote my parents a letter. I took them to counseling. I thought everyone else thinks this is normal. Why can't they just understand this and let me live? Um, so nothing worked. It came down to the decision where I had to choose my parents, my family, my culture, or my new love, and I just couldn't wait to live a new life. The day I left, I took, I had this big garbage bag full of something. I believe it was clothing. It was just my last of my belongings that I could take in one trip. I was waiting for the bus in Calgary, which is a very long time for any bus to wait for. And there's these two strange women, they were just chatting about the weather or something. It was June, it was beautiful, it was dusty. I was clutching my last of my belongings on my way to my new home. And I, I guess I left, nobody said anything, and I just, I was like, this is it, this is my, my escape. And then I was, finally that bus came and I was on my way to my new life. I'm originally from El Salvador, but my family uh, and I moved to Guatemala uh, for a little while because we had a bit of a civil war going on in El Salvador for about 14 years, and we just didn't like the atmosphere. So when we got accepted to come to Canada, uh, we couldn't bring everything that we owned. Um, so my parents took it upon themselves to look through the things that I had and to throw out some of those things and to keep some other ones. Now, uh, the way adults think and the, and the way adults think uh, versus the way that kids think. I'd moved so many times because I lived in Costa Rica and El Salvador and I lived in a lot of different houses. Um, the only things that I had to connect to myself, to my identity, the only friends that I really had throughout all that were my childhood toys. Um, but my parents looked at these old, raggedy, broken things and thought, we'll throw those out, and then the things that we bought him for his birthday, we'll keep those, because they're not shiny and they're new and they're much nicer. Um, so when I came home one day and all my old toys from when I was like two and three or whatever were missing, um, I started crying and I probably didn't stop crying until like a couple months after we got into Canada. Um, <laughs> At this point is when I started exploring my spiritual side because I started praying to God that somehow, some way, I could get my toys back. After doing that, and that, that was a long time because that was, I think, my first real experience of loss uh, that I ever had. And uh, I was seven, by the way, when this was going on. Uh, I must have prayed every day for a year or so. And then one day I just prayed that maybe some kids had found these toys in the dumpster or something and that they had a nice new home. My ancestors from Saudi Arabia said uh, when you come to Vancouver, uh, be surprised that the pubs will tell you to go home make moonshine because you need two bags of potatoes to, 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 to make it, um, to just like making dinner. His name was Ori. 
and we never talk about him anymore. It's as if, if we don't acknowledge him or remember that he was born, he never existed. Because there is that one day at the end of the summer, late August, we're all at the beach of the Great Lakes on Lake Erie. The sand was hot, but it was a windy day. And my family, my cousins, my aunts and uncles, we were all there together. And my brother was in the water. And the waves were pretty high because the Great Lakes is very similar to the ocean and that it's so big. The waves can get pretty high. And he was only five. He just had a little boy's body. He just hadn't... I can't even remember if he was... His imagination was, was growing. And he was my best friend. And I remember being there, stuck in the sand, unable to move, watching him struggling way out in the water, and I was unable to help him. And his head was there, his arm was up, and he was calling for help. And I wasn't able to help him, and the adults weren't able to help him. We were at the mercy of whatever greater forces there were in the world. And his head went under the water, and that was the last time I saw him alive. And later, an hour and a half later, after they had found his body, and he had been taken to the hospital, and my family, my cousins, and my aunts and uncles were all waiting there in the living room. No one knew what to say. There's this heavy sense of suspension, being suspended, not knowing, you know, between life and death. And I'm 10, and I don't know. I don't understand what's going on. And my mom came back, and she came in, and she said, Tori's dead. And my aunts and uncles knew what that meant, and they cried. But my cousins and I, we were all younger. We didn't know, but we knew something sad had happened. And we all gathered around, and we hugged. And that was the last time I ever felt really close to my family, because since then, We haven't spoken about it. And it was like, when I saw him drown, my whole childhood was gone with that. And that was the moment that things were never the same afterwards. And I had to become, not an adult, but I wasn't what I was before. And that moment with my brother drowning was like a key that was given to my heart. Because since then, Part of growing up for me was having to be really close to my heart, and that moment unlocked what it meant to feel. Because grief, grief is like fire, and it will burn you, and it will purify you. And that was the moment when I grew up. Although I miss Jennifer, I thought this was a good, uh it will look good on her resume, and it will give her another, give her a chance to see another part of the world. Like when she first told me, I thought, oh my God, my baby's going away, but I didn't uh, do anything to stop her. And so I said, well, uh, it, this will look good on your resume, and it'll give you a chance to see another part of the world. Although I hate to see you go, I want you to go. So uh, she said she'd be gone uh, from six months to a year on this work visa. And one night I came home from work three months after she went to uh, find her uh, home. I said, you're home. Why didn't you tell me? I would have picked you up from the airport. And she said, well, that was OK, Mom. I didn't want you to go through the trouble. So uh, you mean this was a surprise for your dad and me? She said, yeah. So she told me uh, several hours later, um, Mom, the real reason I came home is because I'm three months pregnant. And I looked at her like, and she went. So I finally regained my composure and said, uh, well, what are you going to do? She said, keep it. I said, OK, if that's, it's your choice, and I support it. And then I made it clear to both her and my older daughter that if pregnancy was to happen, I'll be there for them and support any decision they make. 
And then uh, some people wondered why didn't uh, Jennifer just give the baby up for adoption or why didn't she get an abortion? And uh, Jennifer was saying that some parents make their daughters do that, either or. I said, Jen, I'm not going to make you do that. I said, if you want to keep the baby, that's okay with me. And I'm against abortion. Yes, yeah, so it was 4 a.m. in the morning, but uh, just holding my granddaughter it made me feel proud to announce that I'm a grandma. So uh, every time I uh, looked at that baby, and even today I look at uh, Lily, that's her name, I'm uh, glad Jennifer chose to keep her. Teach your children well Their father's hell Did slowly go by And feed them on your dreams The ones they pick Is one you'll know by Two and a half years ago, I hitchhiked here just before the Olympics. I wanted to protest <laughs> and to learn English. And a few months after, I hitchhiked back to Quebec during the summer. And something happened there that I was not expecting. I wasn't planning on that. Um, just before coming to BC, I, I, I had quitted like, college and work. And so when I went back this summer, I saw like a teacher that I that I had been, I have I had like um, a relationship in the past with him, my philosophy teacher, philosophy. Um, it was not really a relationship; it was like um, we dated sometimes. And and then he, I told him I was in town, and he he, he emailed me that he was happy and. I was here and, and then I realized I was so scared that he will talk to me about what, I, what happened before because we had like a sexual moment before and I was so scared because for me that moment was like so bad and I never told him um, and for him it was like a great moment and he had like nice thoughts about that and so at that time I like read, I was like writing a lot so I I wrote like on my blog like how I felt and how, I, how scared I felt about like reading his email and like not wanting to be like to hear like to hear something like oh I still remember you know how cool it was with you like I did not want to hear anything like that so and then I shared my story with him um, and it was really like intense and then we went to meet up in in a park um, and. He was very like surprised and but he wanted to hear what I had to say um, and I told him what I was that that night uh, with him for me and uh, also unfair it was because like there was no communication when it happened like he just went for me and I I, I was so surprised that I didn't know <coughs> what to say so I just like went with what was going on um, and then I came, and then I came back in BC, um, a couple of weeks after, and I came back with something new. I came back with more strength. I came back with the knowledge that I knew I could like say no. And I guess now I'm still on that journey of like going towards what I, what I am and what I want. Um, and I've also like explored more like, I guess my queerness um, and realizing that I have been with men a lot of the times a bit by like, because of how I was raised in that world and like, so it's, it's a lot of like, new beginning and like it, it's really good
my counselor suggested I talk to my mom about my problems. I went to talk to my mom, but my mom lived a hard life. And so the problems that I had, she didn't understand how that affected me and how that caused me to have emotions. And so she sent me to a camp. And this camp was 14 days in climbing a mountain with 70 pounds on your back. Uh, and you carried everybody's food and you carried all your clothes and you went with a whole group of what were supposed to be, everyone was supposed to be strangers, meeting each other, coming together. And I ended up going with a bunch of people that knew each other. <laughs> and so they were all friends and talking and laughing and I didn't know anybody there. And they were all full-blooded Aboriginal people and I was the white looking girl who was only quarter and so <laughs> they they weren't too fond of me at first and so I go to this camp not very physically fit at all I've never really hiked and there's all these fit Aboriginal students and people around my age and I'm feeling kind of nervous about it, and so I, I get partnered up with this girl just because I guess nobody else wanted to be her partner. And um, she was really digging deep into ecstasy at the time. And so it was our first hike up, and we were just hitting a certain altitude, and it was just messing with her mind. She was having flashbacks, she was seeing things, she was laying on the ground telling me her entire life story. I was sweating profusely. It was horrible. I hadn't gone bathroom because of stress in four days. And when you don't go bathroom in four days, things just lick, turn into a liquid that will find a way to exit your body one way or another. So I'm in a horrible situation. Just everything is not going well. And I'm just trying to get her to go up the hill. Like We have three more hours of hiking left, which doesn't sound very good <laughs> to a person who is in such pain and they don't even really know where they are in the moment. I'm trying to get her to go with me. And this entire time I'm like, I hate my mother. I hate my mother for putting me here. And this is the reason why I'm here. And I haven't gone bathroom in three days because of my mom. And I'm sweating because of my mom. And this crazy girl's having a mental breakdown on this mountain because of my mom. And we're just going up the mountain and we're hiking. And we come to this part where there's a huge cannon. It looks like a huge tear happened in the earth. And there's a tiny tree that goes across and we have to hook ourselves up to a cable and walk across this tree. And we've got 70 pounds on our back and I'm sweating and crazy things are happening to me. And she can barely see where she is. And she can barely know what's going on for her. And she has to walk across this tiny flimsy tree and not look down and not get scared for me to go forward. And I just stopped and we looked around and I said, look where we are. Look at the trees. and." Look at the sunlight coming in through these beautiful green leaves and close your eyes and listen to the water that's so far below you but it's rushing so it sounds like it's just right there. And imagine that if you fall, that that water is just gonna pick you up and hug you and hold you and you're gonna be safe and you can just climb back onto the tree and you'll be fine. And so we go one at a time across this tree and we cross it and we get to the other side and she's just this tiny, tiny woman with this giant bag on her. She gets to the other side and she throws the bag down and she just says, thank you, thank you. And she hugs me and she, she loved me like she loved these people she's known all her life. Sitting at the corner, just passing the time of day, we heard the little um, popcorn grinder singing as he played. 
He had a little monkey with a tin cup in his head. And this was singing, this was his command. He said, love me, love me, love. Why did the other players go? He said, love me, love me, love. Why did he ever go? And it was from Valley View to Edmonton, and it was in the stretch, a very bad stretch, just west of White Court, between White Court and Valley View. Very desolate in this area. And you're on the loneliest stretch of road that you could be on. And one night when I was coming back from a trip, I, it was, I had all the bad driving conditions in the world, blowing snow, snow, everything going wrong, weather-wise. But I had my road lights on and I picked this car up. How I did it, I don't know. That was just one of those things that happens, I guess because I could hardly see it, and it was a light, sandy-colored Cadillac. And why they ever come up with colors for cars that match roads, I'll never know. It was just one of those acts, one of those nights that you really didn't want to be on the road, but if you were on the road, you drove careful. And this car, for some unknown reason, just decided not to go no more. And when I came up, there was hardly any lights left in it, but no heaters or nothing working, frost all over the windows. And I opened the door, the door was unlocked, and there was, it was below zero in the vehicle. And there were two people, a little girl that was wrapped up in everything that she could possibly be wrapped up in, and her mom and I got woke up her mom and I says, what happened? She says, the car won't go. She said, I said, where are you going? She said, Edmonton. And I said, what are you doing on the road tonight? Almost being a father image, and giving her hell for being on the road. And she turned around and she says, just got to get back to my husband. I says, if he knew you were on the road, would he be happy with you? Well, not really, especially with your little girl. And uh, I said, by the way, I said, let's get that little girl into the truck where it's warm, and you too, for that matter. So loaded them up in the truck, loaded the car on the trailer, had a high boy trailer on, and I loaded the car up. It took me about 20 minutes to tie it all down and everything. Got it. Got into White Court. Everybody was out cold except me. I had a coffee and then continued on into Edmonton. Lord, I'm one, Lord, I'm two, Lord, I'm three, Lord, I'm four, Lord, I'm five. I became a drug addict about 10 years ago, and um, it was uh, it's difficult to sort of see how I got to being a, a street-level drug addict where I lived on the street as a single woman for six years in cubby holes and um, filthy, dirty, and homeless, foodless, all that, from where I came from in West Van and, and having a very privileged life and travel and education, culture and money. and. So there I was, and uh, I ended up getting an infection in my heart, and I got very sick and ended up in a coma for three weeks. 
I uh, was still an addict, so I was in the hospital for eight weeks, and I couldn't use because I couldn't get down to get drugs. I was getting lots of painkillers there, but it wasn't quite taking me away like I was used to. So I came down from the hospital as soon as I could walk. And I'd been told if I injected drugs again that I would die. And I remember a moment in the alley, and it was just, um, just after dark, and it was March, it was uh, rainy a little bit, and it was very cold, and I was in such pain getting on the bus and my, my back was just throbbing. I uh, got off the bus and I, my dealer was about a block away from where the bus stopped. And I thought I'm not gonna make it. And then my dealer was there, he just was walking by. It was incredible because I couldn't have walked a block. And uh, I remember stopping and thanking God for helping me to get drugs easily because I just had to have them. And I remember I walked just inside the alley because I couldn't walk too far, but so that I was out of sight because I don't like to inject on the street, obviously. And I remember cleaning the spot and putting on the tourniquet and, and injecting the drugs and thinking, I'm gonna die. Because that's what they told me and I was ready to die. And I just, the drugs were more important. And I didn't think of my three children or my family, my parents, my brothers, my son. So anyways, I put the drugs in and I just got immediate searing pain in my body and my heart gave out and I couldn't walk. Um, and that was the moment I started to grow up uh, because that was the moment I started to not want to die. And I'm still on that journey. So blow a hundred miles. After every other day of counting on myself uh, for a three minute shower, um, after spending a, a year in solitary confinement, uh, we later opened up the yard, came out, and I'm laying on the grass thinking. Uh, now that I've got some fresh air, and the sun is shining, uh, there's not much else around here. It's pretty bleak and pretty dismal. And um, I'm thinking, you know, I, I don't know why I'm out here. I, I, I want to go back to my cell. It's, it's just so bleak. And then a bird came and landed about 15 feet away from me, and it was everything, my mood totally changed. Uh, it was like I'd seen a bird for the first time in my life. And this bird started to give me such joy as I watched it, you know, just hop around on the ground and, and um, playing around. Uh, but it wasn't too long when I realized that the bird has wings and the bird can just fly up over that wall to freedom. But I couldn't do that. So now, in my second mind, this bird, is mocking me because there's nothing really there for it that should interest him. And he sees me in all my frustration, and so he's here to prance around in front of me and mock me. And so I'm mad at the bird now uh, before the bird starts to talk back to me. And the bird said to me, Mark, who told you this is a prison? Did man tell you this is a prison? And who is man to tell you such a thing when there's just another place to be? Stand by. 
by me If the sky will look an autumn Come ball and fall Or the mountain To the moon To the sea I won't cry Simba. Simba.